once you're more comfortable with forces, it's very natural that we combine what we learned from the previous chapters about kinematics into a problems with forces and kinematics together. Because what we're dealing with is sum of forces is equal to ma, and this a here we can get by kinematics. Then we can find out various, various things about forces. And that's exactly what's happening here. So here we have a basketball player ready to jump, so he squats down and then takes off, fully extended, moving upwards, and then he flies up into the air by a certain amount at the very top, so no longer moving, so no speed lines. The one point on the body that we track is of course the center of mass, which is roughly about just below your belly button, and at this point, let's call that y equals zero, and they say that from the fully squat to the full extension, it's 0.3 meters, and then from takeoff, which is full extension, he leaps up 0.9 meters off the ground, which means the center of mass, assuming his body doesn't change shape as he jumps, will be 1.2 meters higher than when he was started when he was squatting, because it's another 0.9 on top of this 0.3. And as soon as he has taken off, the basketball player is not touching anything. So in that sense, he's only under the influence of gravity as he travels through the air, and that's falling motion from last chapter. So we know that between 2 and 3, the acceleration is negative g, provided that we call pause upwards, and so this here is g downwards. And also, since at this third time, that's his highest point, we know that d3 is equal to 0. So we can use kinematics to kind of work backwards to ultimately solve each part of the question. In part A, they're asking us to calculate the velocity when he leaves the floor. When he leaves the floor, that for us is time 2, so they want that. Since we know the acceleration between time 2 and 3, and we know v3, we can make use of plus 2 to 3, delta t 2 to 3. Although we don't know the time, so let's use the other equation that doesn't involve the time, which is my 2 delta y 2 to 3 times a 2 to 3 is equal to v3 squared minus v2 squared. So since v3 is 0, we know that v2 squared is negative 2 delta y 2 to 3, a 2 to 3, and that's negative 2. The difference in heights between time 2 and time 3, you've gained 0.9 meters, or 1.2 minus 0.3 meters. You have negative 9.8 meters per second square for your acceleration because it's downward. These two kind of cancels out, and we can take the square root of whatever we get here to get our number, which is 4.2 meters per second. At his velocity when he leaves the floor is 4.2 meters per second upwards. For part B, they want the acceleration while he's straightening his legs, so in here. So let's call that a jump. And we don't know that bit, because he is touching the floor, he could be pushing really hard on the floor and then therefore the floor pushes really hard on him, which we'll find out in part C. But he's not in the air, so we don't know his acceleration, it's not negative g. But now knowing v2, and we know v1 is 0 because that's before he starts moving, we can use the same kinematics equation to find out what my acceleration is. Again, we have 2 delta y 1 to 2 this time. a1 to 2 is equal to v2 squared minus v1 squared. In this case, we have 2 0 0.3 meters. This is a jump that we're not sure what it is. This we just worked out to be the square bit. Now ah, let's keep that minus 0. And so a jump is 4.2 meters per second all squared divided by 2 times that. Working out the number, we get 29.4 meters per second squared, which is substantial, but he doesn't do it for very long. Don't forget the direction of upwards. Let's look back at the question. Part 3 now, now forces come in. They want to calculate the force he exerts on the floor to do this. How hard he pushes on the floor. However, 
when he push on the floor, the floor doesn't move because it's attached to all kinds of things. It's much easier to analyze the forces that are on the basketball player. Thankfully, because of Newton's third law, whatever force the basketball player pushes on the floor, so this is, let's say, F jump, the floor will be pushing back just as hard on the basketball player. We often call this the normal force because this force is perpendicular to the surface of the floor, but in this case, let's just call it a floor. And we know by Newton's third law that these two forces must have the exact same size. We also know they go in opposite direction, but mainly it's on the same size. And do note that they do go on two separate different free body diagrams. These two forces never go on the same diagram, so they never cancel out. But let's focus back on the basketball player now. So he's being pushed by the floor by a certain amount of force. And he's also being on Earth under the influence of gravity. So he's got Mg acting downwards on him. Those are the two forces that are acting on my basketball player. So those are the two forces that I would draw for my free body diagram of the basketball player. I don't really care what he's doing to other things. So we can now sum up forces to relate my acceleration, which we know that to be a jump. We'll get to that in a second. The sum of forces. Again, we'll say upward is positive. So we have m floor minus mg. And since the magnitude of m floor is the same as this f jump, I can replace it like that. Again, we're all just dealing with magnitude now that we've got the signs figured out. It's equal to ma, so f jump is equal to mg plus ma, which sort of makes sense because the force that he's pushing down the floor has to both support his own weight and to provide for the acceleration. So you can factor out the m if you want. So we're told that he is 110 kilograms, g is 9.8 meters per second square, and a is what we find out 29.7 meters per second square. Putting it all together, he provides a substantial force in order to make this jump of 4,312 newtons. And that's our part C. So you can see how naturally it comes together with kinematics and forces.